بسم اللہ خان رحیم اینڈ السلام علیکم پاکستان وی ور ٹاکنگ اباؤٹ آڈٹس انٹرنل آڈٹس ان آر پریویس سیشن اینڈ ٹوڈے وی گوئی ٹو گو آن انادر ڈائمینشن آف کارپوریٹ گورننس اینڈ دیٹ از دا ڈیولپمنٹ آف ریجنز اینڈ لا ناؤ مینی ٹائمز وین وی ٹاک اباؤٹ لا دین دے سی دیٹ لا ایکچولی واز دیئر ٹائم اے میموریل آئی مین دا لاز آف دا یونیورس دا لاز آف اللہ دا لاز آف گاڈ اینڈ سنس ہیومن بینگس ہیو بین ایگزٹنگ Laws in one form or the other have always been there. There have been certain lo- rules. There have been regulations. So all of these rules and regulations, if applied upon society, are actually the law or the law of the land, the law of the community, the law of the society. Now, when we are talking about laws again, so there's a very famous saying that laws are made like sausages. Now, what is the context of sausage and law? That is a very important aspect. Well, Because we all know that a sausage basically is made from all of the waste material which is found in one particular animal and then it is basically heated and goes through a process melted and then it is refrozen and a beautiful piece of meat emerges. Now, laws are also like that. When we see that there is chaos in society, when we see that there is indiscipline in society, when we see that Uh, society does not have any point of confirmance or conformance, then we see that society gets together. They have these long debates, these discussions, these disagreements, and new laws start forming shape, and finally they are promulgated. And when we look at the final picture of the law, then that law is like poetry. It looks beautiful. It's the beauty of language, which is put together in the form of a law, which is implemented upon the citizens or the community members and it is ensured that is something which is called rule of law, that everyone follows it. Now, when we look at the different pillars of the state, then we can see that when we are talking about law, then law is promulgated by the parliament and then it is implemented by the executive, by the judiciary and it is disseminated by the media and it is applied upon civil society. So again, it's a beautiful framework, but still there is chaos, there is misunderstanding, there are different interpretations and that can lead to conflicts also. And again, when we are talking about corporate governance, then there are certain laws which apply on corporate governance. And we are going to see the, the development of the origins of the whole corporate structure which has emerged and then the application of the different laws. So when we are looking at the evolution of the corporate form, it can be traced from the common origin in the family and closely held capitalism of the early 19th century with the protection of ownership rights. And managerial capitalism uh, of the 20th century basically uh, then brought in the protections for listed corporations, protections for li- limited liability corporations, protection of min- minority interests, reassertion of increasing boards, uh, control over managers, arrival of mass ownership, in the institutional investor. So what we see is, is that the post uh, industrial revolution basically created these large ownerships. And we see that there was this shift from the agrarian economy into the industrial economy, which led into the capitalistic economy. And we see that the old model of fiefdoms, of, uh, of royalty, of aristocracy was changing into a new corporate model. And therefore, what we see is that a lot of development in the corporate sector took place in the 19th century and then was further uh, advanced in the 20th century. And then in the 21st century, we see the corporate governance model being applied in its true sense, along with something which is called uh, corporate social responsibility, which we're going to look at in more detail uh, later on. So we see that through this, there was the protection for listed corporations protection for limited liability corporations, protection of minority interests, not only the majority is important, minority is important, reassertion of increasing board control over managers, and that was a counter check, and the arrival of mass ownership in the institutional investor. So all of these aspects basically emerged, and we see that uh, over the 20th century, they became much more mature, and all of this was then incorporated into different models, different frameworks, different rules, regulations, and laws. So uh, what we see is that different routes were taken and as a result different destinations also brought up. 
such as the Asian corporate governance model, the European corporate governance, the Anglo-American corporate governance, the Latin American corporate governance, German model of corporate governance, and the Japanese model of corporate governance. So we see that these six major uh, models are basically emerged. They have their own dimensionalities. And in our other sessions, we have talked about them in great detail. So all of these basically started dominating the world. And one way or the other, different countries started following these particular models based upon their own culture, based upon their own nuances, based upon their own idiosyncrasies, based upon their own structures, and again, their own expectations. Now, when we look at the development of regions, then there is the dispersed ownership model. It is characterized by strong liquid security markets, high disclosure standards, and high market transparency. The market for corporate control is the ultimate disciplining mechanism. So this is more disciplined, but it has a bigger, uh, bigger outlay, has a bigger landscape, and we see that the canvas of it is characterized by strong liquid securities markets, high disclosure, and high market transparency. So this is the characteristic of this particular model. Then there is the concentrated ownership model, characterized by controlling shareholders, weak securities markets, low transparency, and disclosure standards, a central monitoring role for large banks who have a stake in the company. So again, this is a different model where there is more concentration, lesser disbursement, uh, fewer shareholders, and they basically are controlling everything. Now, when we are talking about the legal field, that how is all of this protected, then we see that it is relevant to the existence and operation of corporate governance. So we see financial model regulations, we see corporate law, and we see labor law. Now, if we look at all of this, then this is a huge canvas. Now, if we just look at labor laws, for example, and we look at the, the, the country of Pakistan, then there are 149 labor laws. Now, how are these labor laws basically applied? They have to be in conformance with the International Labor Organization. And we see that these 149 uh, labor laws are in a code uh, of labor law, which is nearly 4,000 pages thick. Now, who's going to ever understand them? Who's going to apply them? There's so many overlaps. There's so many gray areas. So yes, law has developed, but maybe it has developed too much. We see in corporate law, there are hundreds and hundreds of different types of laws. So an organization actually is getting into an imbroglio that there are so many laws, and how are they going to conform to all of those laws? And therefore, they are always open to litigation and also open uh, to the education of the courts because there is so much which has to be understood and it becomes sometimes very difficult for organizations to follow the financial model, the corporate model, and the labor model. Now, all of these basically triangulate to form the legal framework of a particular organization. And like I was mentioning, there are a lot of gray areas. So it is open to interpretation and that interpretation sometimes leads to conflict. And that is why there are special commercial courts, there are special labor courts, and we also have special financial courts or uh, banking tribunals. So these different courts tend to exist, which are specialized, and they tend to overlook the different mechanisms of an organization and ensure that the different organizations and corporations are following the rule of law. And that is the most important thing, that there should be merit, there should be rule of law, there should be transparency, there should be accountability, there should be third party audit, there should be internal audit, and most importantly, all of it has to be done within the legal frameworks which exist within the law of the land and are then further augmented and reinforced through the different uh, through the different corporate governance models which they apply upon a particular corporation thank you so much